right, so welcome to everyone. This is the um, beginning of our conference on climate change with, with uh, myself and uh, Peter Anker and, um, and DeWitt have organized for over the past year or so, and so we're very delighted that it is beginning tonight. Um, so I want to just make some opening remarks to invite Naomi Oreskes out. So on behalf of the Gallatin Distinguished uh, Speaker Series and the Gallatin Initiate, uh, Initiative on Climate Change, I am delighted to welcome the most distinguished Naomi Oreskes back to the Gallatin School and to thank her for inaugurating our conference on climate change and for being our keynote speaker today. Naomi Oreskes is affiliated professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Harvard University. She is the author of numerous articles, essays, and books on the climate, including the best-selling Merchants of Doubt, probably one of the most important books that has come out on this subject, and The Collapse of Western Civilization, co-authored with Eric M. Conway. Both books have been translated into many languages, and uh, the Collapse of Western Civilization has been made into a movie. Uh, she, uh, more than 50 of Professor Oreskes opinion pieces have appeared in journals and newspapers such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times. Uh, she also published the first peer review pieces, first peer review paper to quantify the scientific consensus on climate change and has documented the history and origins of climate change denial and its links to the tobacco industry. One of her proudest accomplishments is that she wrote the preface for the Melville House edition of the Papal Encyclical on Climate Change and also that she climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, which I think is pretty amazing. <laughs> Her current project is, call, is expected in 2008 is called Science on a Mission, American Oceanography from the Cold War to Climate Change. The title of her talk tonight is Narratives of Climate Change. So let's welcome Naomi Oreskes. <laughs> I always say it's a pleasure to be wherever I am because it generally is, but it's an especial pleasure to be here tonight for reasons that most of you know and to see old friends like Bella and other people that I taught with uh, back when I was in kindergarten and Bella was like 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thanks for that warm introduction. Just one thing, actually, Merchants of Doubt has been made into a documentary film. Collapse of Western Civilization has not yet oh, been. So for those of you who are aspiring filmmakers who teach at the Tisch School, uh, it's a great story about the end of the world. So if you're interested, <laughs> come and talk to me. Okay. All right, so as Bella said, I'm going to talk to you today about narratives of climate change. Many of you heard last week the latest outrage of the week was Scott Pruitt telling us after the devastation in Houston and Florida that now was not the time to talk about climate change. Well, of course, if Scott Pruitt says it, you know it's not true, so it's kind of easy in that one. There's like not really any ambiguity on that one. But I want to say that actually now is exactly the time to talk about climate change. And why is that? Well, because what we've just seen in the last two weeks is the human face of climate change. For more than 15 years now, I've been working on this issue, and one of the things that's hard about climate change is it's been hard to get across to people why this matters to us, why this is a human story, why this is about our lives, our economy, why this isn't just about polar bears, although I personally love polar bears. Um, but now it's vivid. Now it's in front of our eyes. Now there's no denying that this is the human face of climate change. And it's an ugly face. It's a face of death and destruction. Another way of thinking about it is this is scientific theory made real. And this is our opportunity then to take this and say, now is the time to talk about what it means when climate change starts really hitting home, literally. So the question is not should we talk about it, but how should we talk about it? What is the right way, or what are the right ways, or what are the different ways in which we can talk about this problem and reach out to different people with different interests in different places for whom different aspects of this problem may be salient? Now, I think the answer to this problem is not entirely obvious, and I think one of the reasons, one of the difficulties about climate change is there are so many different ways in which it can be characterized. 
So we could say that's an opportunity or a difficulty, it's probably both, but it matters because the diverse characterizations lead to different s solutions, different ways of thinking about solving the problem. So what I want to do today is to just talk about what I see as sort of six major narratives of climate change that are already out there, talk about some of the things that they make clear, some of the strengths of these narratives, but also talk about what I'm beginning to think is missing from all of this previous work, including my own. So I, I say essentially there are six narratives. One is the science narrative, probably the most familiar one. The second is the failure of science narrative. A third is a failure of capitalism. A fourth is my own work, which I call the merchants of doubt narrative. A fifth is another version of the failure of capitalism. And then the sixth is what we could call the economist or market failure narrative. So in a sense, these are all uh, pretty much, well, most of these are narratives of failure. And of course, part of what we're trying to do here is to come up with a narrative of success. So I want to say that all these are important and valuable. This is not a criticism of any of the pri prior work. It's more about thinking about what have we done so far and what do we need to do going forward. I think all of these narratives touch on important aspects of this issue. But I do think that there's something that is underdeveloped in all of this previous work, including my own. And that's understanding climate change as a problem of what I'm calling power and power. And by that I mean power in the sense of energy, because climate change is linked to the problem of how we run our economy, the fuels, the literal fuels that run our economy, and also political power, which is linked to the ideologies of capitalism, we can call it laissez-faire capitalism, neoliberalism, free market fundamentalism, whatever term you like best. So as I just said, power is energy, the actual physical thermodynamic energy that runs industrial and post-industrial society, whether it's coal, oil, gas, electricity, solar, wind, whatever. And power as political power, the political power that doesn't want to permit a change in the cultural, economic, and political status quo. And I'm excited to talk about this here tonight because I actually think Gallatin and NYU, it's such an intellectually diverse environment here and I think there are a lot of people here who know a lot about these kinds of issues and could usefully contribute to pushing, pushing this sort of analysis further. So I want to look at, at each of these in turn to think about what they illuminate and what they don't illuminate. And uh, as I've already said, all of them are correct to at least some extent but maybe incomplete. So. And as I've already said, since we're here at Gallatin, is there a more complete narrative that we, particularly the interdisciplinarians around among us, do we still call ourselves that? <laughs> uh, that seems a little ironic to become interdisciplinarians, but you know what I mean. And, and would it matter if we did? And of course, I want to say it does matter because each of these narratives is a causal narrative on some level. Different causal narratives point in the direction of different solutions, or at least different priorities in the portfolios of solutions. So how we tell the story also points in different directions in terms of how we might address and ultimately solve it. Okay, so let's start with the science narrative. This is a very familiar one. It's one I've lived with for a long time. It's the story that all my scientific colleagues tell. It's the story of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the National Academies of Sciences. It's the story of all the scientific assessments in which scientists have worked to explain what climate change is, what our scientific understanding of it is, and what we can expect to happen in the future if we continue business as usual. In this narrative, climate change is framed fu fundamentally as a scientific question. It's tied to UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, Article 2, which specifies, this goes back to 1992, it specifies that the goal of the UN Framework Convention is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system, or what some of us affectionately call DAI. So in this framing, this is essentially a scientific question because scientists are supposed to or are expected to, def to define what constitutes DAI. And the answer that scientists have given that almost everyone is now familiar with is two degrees that up to two degrees we probably can manage, we could probably adapt, although I think some scientists are even questioning that right now. Some people are saying it should have been 1.5. I think after what we've seen this last two weeks, we've had about one degree of climate warming overall, and we're actually seeing that there's already been dangerous anthropogenic interference. But nevertheless, the point here is that scientists uh, answer the question 
it's fundamentally a scientific question, which then is expected to lay the groundwork or the framing uh, for governance and governmental action. So as I've already said, we have two degrees, and that two degrees is linked to also 350 parts per million as a, as a physical limit in the atmosphere. Now we're at over 400. But in general, this narrative is a kind of optimistic or good news narrative because the scientists involved believed, and many still believe, that overall, if scientists could articulate in a clear and convincing way what the scientific evidence is, that the world would act. And in this narrative, Paris is seen as a success. That despite its weakness, the Paris Accord is taken as a success because despite what's happening in the United States, the rest of the world has accepted the science. The rest of the world has accepted that two degrees should be an upper limit, and maybe it's really 1.5. The rest of the world is, in fact, moving forward on the basis of scientific knowledge. So this is essentially a success story in the minds of most scientists, although if you get them over a beer, a lot of them will tell you, well, actually, Paris isn't really adequate, and there's a lot of problems. But still, it's a kind of hopeful narrative. And you'll notice that in this narrative, power and ideology do not appear at all. We have facts, and we act on the facts. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to get distracted all evening as I notice the people in the audience that I know. OK, so that optimistic narrative then also invites a more critical narrative. And this is the one I'll call the failure of science narrative. Uh, this is the narrative that Josh Howe puts forward in his wonderful book, Behind the Curve. He's not the only person who has developed this critique, but this is probably the best and most well articulated. Um, Josh published this book before Paris, but I think it, the Paris, what happened in Paris would affirm it. In this argument, we see that even though we have the UN Framework Convention, even though scientists have articulated this idea of a two degree limit or threshold, but the reality is we have not managed to keep atmospheric greenhouse gases below to 350 parts per million, much less 350 equivalent when you consider all the other greenhouse gases. Um, the Paris Accord is not adequate. The, the commitments that people have made are not adequate. And right now, the world is, despite whatever successes we have, on a track that is leading not just past two degrees, but past three degrees, probably past four degrees. I mean, so we are right now on a track that is leading towards you know, a kind of really what would have been viewed back in the 90s as a worst case scenario. So why did this happen? Well, Josh wants to say that scientists bear some of the responsibility for this, that scientists were insensitive to the politics of knowledge, to the realities of power, that they followed a linear model where they assumed that if they supplied evidence to policymakers, then policymakers would say, thank you very much, and they would take that evidence and they would use it. Um, and that scientists were a bit arrogant, that they believed that their expertise would be determinative. So if scientists said to the world, we need to do this, that the world would say, oh, yes, of course we do. But as we all know, that's not what happened, and it's generally not what actually happens uh, in the world. So in this narrative, ideology does appear, but it's the ideology of the linear model, that facts lead to action. And Josh is saying, well, that idea is, is not not supported by the evidence. A different way of thinking about the problem is to shift away from the science and to think about the larger economic and social structures around this problem. The person who has done this most famously and effectively is clearly Naomi Klein in her book, uh, This Changes Everything. Her argument, as many of you probably know, is that there's a fundamental incompatibility between capitalism as a system and care for the environment, care for the health and well-being of people and plants and animals. She argues that short-term profit motive is necessarily controlling, and any other concerns are always given short shrift. And so she concludes, and I actually saw an interview on television a few years ago where she said this, that the merchants of doubt were right, that climate change does require the end of capitalism. And I mean, I'll talk about this more, but in our book we argued that the scientists who became merchants of doubt did it because they were very right-wing, anti-communist, they were afraid that regulation, environmental regulation, would be a kind of slippery slope to socialism, and then that's why they challenged the scientific evidence. And Naomi Klein said, well, when she was reading our book, she realized, oh, they're right, um, which kind of gave me a heart attack because I don't actually agree with that. <laughs> anyway, so her argument is it's not a liberal conspiracy to bring down global capitalism, but it's actually more profound than that. It's kind of a failure inside of capitalism 
a physical reality that proves capitalism is incompatible with planetary limits, and therefore it needs to come to an end, or else the world will. Now, power plays a very important role in her narrative. It's the power of multinational corporations to control governments and protect action, and therefore it needs to be countered, she wants to argue, by the power of grassroots activism. Now, as I said, she, she said that her book was actually inspired in part by reading Merchants of Doubt, by realizing they were right, that this does mean the end of capitalism. Of course, I don't, I shouldn't say of course, I don't actually agree with that, and neither does my colleague Eric Conway. Um, ours was really a narrative of what we would call capitalist ideology run amok, that these cold warriors were so, their anxiety, their anti-communist anxiety was so profound that any attempt to intervene in the marketplace, any attempt to regulate the marketplace, they viewed as a step in the direction of Soviet totalitarianism. And therefore, they opposed all forms of regulation, including of tobacco or of the pollution that causes acid rain or the ozone hole or the regulation of lead paint, for example, um, because they feared, they, as she correctly says, they feared it would mean the end of capitalism. But and, and that explains, or what we, what we say in the book, is that explains why the Republican Party in conservative America then becomes aligned with climate change denial, because climate change denial is seen as part and pa parcel of a defense of free market capitalism, and for them, of liberty and American individualism as well. Now, in our argument, ideology plays a major role because it explains the motivation. What we were trying to understand is why would scientists participate in this? Like, why would a credible scientist go work for the tobacco industry or go work involved in climate change denial, especially because the people we studied were successful, they were wealthy, there was very little evidence that they were actually doing it for the money. So if it's not money, then what is it going to be? It has to be something else, power, ideology, ego, you know, these sorts of things. So. We wanted to answer the question, why would scientists turn against science, turn against their own colleagues? And um, the answer was, was this ideological story. Now, we don't have an analysis of how their ideas became powerful. That is to say, we explain how and why they did what they did. Um, we don't really, it's a kind of supply side story. We explain why they supply these doubt mongering arguments. We don't really analyze how and why they get taken up, except to the limited ex extent that we argue that it resonates with sort of traditional conservative ideology in the United States. But it is the case that the one of the things that's important about these people is that they have access to the corridors of power. And they have that access because of the work they did in the Cold War, building the hydrogen bomb, building the atomic bombs, building rocketry programs, and things of that sort. Okay, a fifth narrative is also a failure of capitalism narrative, but it's a rather different sort of narrative than Naomi Klein's. And it's Pope Francis's narrative in his encyclical on climate change and inequality. So it's related to Naomi's Klein's, Naomi Klein's argument, but with a much greater emphasis on moral and spiritual values. I see the encyclical as essentially having two core messages. One is a theological message about respect for and love and preservation of creation which includes all our fellow human beings, but also plants, animals, and the physical environment, and also a political message about our current socioeconomic system and how it threatens and undermines the first message. Now, in my experience, most academics or many academics have read some of the other books I've talked about. In my experience, most people haven't read the encyclical. I meant to ask the question, how many people here have read the encyclical? Okay, a few, but mostly not. So I want to spend a little bit more time talking about the Pope's message because I think it's incredibly powerful. I also think it's a great thing to teach in class because it's so provocative and because the Pope speaks in a very clear voice because he believes in his own moral authority in a way that I think other people often have trouble with. Um, and also because we know, because I was involved in it, that the Pope worked unbelievably hard on this and consulted with many, many people, including many scientists, uh, before he came to his own views about what the, what the story is. So the theological message is this. Because human dignity finds its roots in our common creation, that is to say, all, we're all created by God, that caring for our fellow citizen and caring for the environment are the same thing. It's not a question of people versus the environment and choosing which is most important. It's a question of abandoning the notion of versus altogether. And to argue that respect for creation and respect for human dignity 
are just two aspects of the same idea. The Pope adamantly rejects the idea that the biblical injunction to have dominion over nature, which is often invoked by capitalists and climate change deniers, means that we can use creation in any way we want. And this is a really important point because of some of you, especially if you teach environmental studies or environmental history, you know this argument is often made that the wreckage of the environment is maybe can be partly blamed on Judeo-Christian theology, and this is why particularly in the industrialized West, we have this you know, very hostile relationship to our environment. Um, and also, in my own work on climate change denial, we can find the executives of coal company actually invoking this argument, literally, saying God gave us coal to use, and therefore we need to use it. Um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> they really say that. Okay, so this is really amazing. So the Pope has taken this on head on, and he says it's wrong. He says it's false. He says, quote, this is an inadequate presentation of Christian anthrop... Oh, that's a, that's a Freudian slip. That should be Christian theology. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Christian theology that gave rise to a wrong understanding of the relationship between human beings and the world. I actually love this Pope because I, like, I really feel like it in, it's very empowering because sometimes you're in class and some student says something that's just totally wrong and you never feel like you can say, oh, that's wrong. You always say, well, that's interesting. Does anybody else in the class have another view? But the Pope doesn't feel like he needs to do that. So it's wrong. It's a wrong understanding of the relationship between human beings and the world. Our dominion over the universe should be understood more properly in this sense of responsible stewardship. And of course, this is the argument that green environmentalists have been using for some time, and the Pope is saying that's correct. He writes, the earth was here before us, and it has been given to us. Affirming this allows us to respond to the charge that Judeo-Christian thinking, on the basis of the Genesis account, which grants man dominion over the earth, Genesis 128, has encouraged the unbridled exploitation of nature by painting him as domineering and destructive by nature. And he concludes, this is not a correct interpretation of the Bible as understood by the church. But it's not just about theology. The Pope is linking this to a political message or a message about political economy. And he argues that under contemporary capitalism, we have deified the market. So this is where the theology and the political economy come together. And we've deified the values of the marketplace at the expense of other considerations. So he writes, quote, it should always be kept in mind that environmental protection cannot be assured solely on the basis of financial calculations of costs and benefits. The environment is one of those goods that cannot be adequately safeguarded or protected by market forces. We need to reject a magical conception of the market, which would suggest that problems can be solved simply by an increase in the profits of companies or individuals. And those of you who read the New York Times will see that Brett Stevens made exactly that argument just about a week ago in the New York Times. And if you don't believe me, go back and read it. Th he exactly says this. As long as we increase profits and stay wealthy, it'll all be fine. The Pope says, no, <laughs> it won't all be fine. Um, is it realistic to hope that those who are obsessed with maximizing profits will stop to reflect on the environmental damage which they will leave behind for future generations? Where profits alone count, there can be no thinking about the rhythms of nature its phases of decay and regeneration, or the complexity of ecosystems, which may be gravely upset by human interventions. So this raises an interesting question. Is the Pope rejecting capitalism? Well, the New York Times accused him of that. Eduardo Porter, right after the encyclical came out, said exactly that. But I don't think that's actually a correct interpretation. In fact, it's really interesting. The word capitalism does not actually appear in the encyclical anywhere. However, the word market or its variants, market, marketplace, appears 19 times and usually in a critique. My reading is that the Pope is not advocating communism, and this is a man who's very well versed in liberation theology, so he could have invoked liberation theology if he had wanted to, but he doesn't. But he is asking us to acknowledge that we live in a world where the ideology of the marketplace is so dominant that many of us can scarcely imagine an alternative and where those who try to are dismissed as unrealistic, irrational, naive, faint-hearted, sentimental, romantic, out of step, or if we're in America, communist. <laughs> so he's asking us to re-examine what he calls the creed of individualism, unlimited progress, competition, consumerism, and the unregulated market. And when you think about this, you can really begin to see why this is such a problem in the United States, right? Because so many places in the world 
don't glorify individualism the way we do in the United States. Don't glorify the notion of limitless progress or don't assume limitless progress or competition or consumerism. So, so much of this is really tied up with American values. And of course, I would suggest that the Pope knows that. <laughs> okay, so this is a narrative of the failure of values, of the over-reliance on the values of the marketplace at the expense of other values such as love, respect, caring, and equity. And there's actually a very beautiful part of the encyclical where the Pope talks about St. Francis, which is, of course, his namesake, and how St. Francis would preach to the animals and the birds. And it's, it's very poetic. It's, if you haven't read it, it's really worth reading. So it's an ideological message against what Francis Bacon a long, long time ago called the idols of the marketplace. And that brings us to the economists. <laughs> so there's also what we could call the economist narrative. And the two books that I think are most interesting in this respect are the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change and Bill Nordhaus's book, Climate Casino. So this is a narrative of market failure. It's not a failure of capitalism writ large, but it is a failure of an aspect of capitalism, which is the failure of markets to, be, to accommodate or deal with the problem of external costs in this case, the external cost of carbon, or what's sometimes called the social cost of carbon, that is to say, costs that are not reflected in the market price. Nicholas Stern, the former chief economist of the World Bank, now the London School of Economics, has called anthropogenic climate change, quote, the greatest and widest ranging market failure ever seen. So in this narrative, it can be fixed, and it can be fixed with the appropriate market-based intervention. That could be a carbon tax, it could be an emissions trading system, but it's not that big a deal. So Nick Stern asks, so why are we waiting? Why are we not doing this thing when we actually have a remedy, a known remedy, and we know it works too? I mean, one thing that's interesting about this whole thing, often you'll hear cri critics um, say, oh, I'm not cl denying climate change, but you know, emissions trading doesn't work. We'll just create a whole new government bureaucracy and won't solve the problem. Well, that's not true. How many of you know where emissions trading has worked, is proven to have worked in the United States to deal with an environmental problem? And not Peter Anker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody, right? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Susan. Isn't it in the Northeast over acid rain? Yeah, there's actually two examples. That's one of them. So one of them was the Clean Air Act am uh, amendments of 1995 instituted an emissions trading program to control the sulfur pollution that leads to acid rain, mostly in the northeastern United States and Canada. And that program has been successful. In fact, it's a good example of how we often see failures and we don't see success. Um, we take success for granted. We stop worrying about acid rain. We moved on to other things. But it was a hugely successful program. Um, the other big example, anybody know or want to guess? No. What's that? Ozone? Uh, no, ozone wasn't solved with emissions trading. Ozone was actually solved by banning a group of substances that caused it. Um, no, the other example is something called RECLAIM, the regional, um, I never remember what RECLAIM stands for, but it was the program that was put in place in Southern California, also in the early 1990s, in Riverside, Orange, and Los Angeles counties, the three counties in America that had the worst air pollution in the, in the United States, air pollution so bad that people sometimes dropped dead in the streets of Los Angeles. That doesn't happen anymore. People still get killed in Los Angeles, but by other things. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, we solved the problem. If you spend time in Los Angeles, you can see the San Bernardino Mountains now. LA is a very different place today than it was 30 years ago, and it's largely because of reclaim that the air in Southern California got cleaned up, and it was done through emissions trading. And nobody knows that. So this gets back to the question of narratives. We need to do a better job of talking about the solutions that we actually have, that we've used and have worked. Nick Stern does do this in his book, and he's one of the few people. OK, so this is a, kind of a somewhat positive narrative that we can fix this problem, and it doesn't actually have to be all that disruptive, although obviously it's disruptive to certain people and certain interests. And so that's part of the problem. Why are we waiting? Why haven't we done this if we know that actually we could do it, and at least a lot of the problem, maybe not everything, but a lot of it could be fixed. Um, so, as a, okay, so like I said, this is just basically saying we need a mid-course correction. So what I want to argue is, in a way, the answer to Nick Stern's question, why are we waiting, is because people are stopping us. Because there are very, very strong power interests, as all of you know, that don't want this problem to be fixed because it would come at their expense. And they don't mind if other people get hurt as long as they don't get hurt. 
And so I think we need to find ways to address this question of power more fully in our narratives and stories of climate change. So in my own recent work since finishing Merchants of Doubt, I've been trying to think through this question of you know, who is really responsible um, and what is the story that they have told us that has made it so difficult to, to do these things, which in some cases, I mean, I, I largely agree with Nick Stern. I mean, I don't, I don't think that a carbon tax by itself will totally solve this problem, but I certainly think there's good evidence to think it would take us a good way towards solving it. So why haven't we done it? So I'm going to slightly change gears now and talk about some recent work that I'm doing in, in terms of thinking through um, a richer, deeper engagement th with these questions about uh, power and ideology in 20th century America. So this is an advertisement from an advertising campaign in the early 1960s. This particular one, I think, was 1962. And you can see the caption says, how is freedom lost? And you can see this picture of this very sad East German behind the Berlin Wall. So what do you think this is an advertisement for? What's that? Tobacco? <laughs> Regulation? Barbed wire? <laughs> Somebody once said hats, maybe? Okay, <laughs> the answer is, oh, oh, so this was a political party, maybe Barry Goldwater, uh, an American church? No, the answer is electricity. This is an a ad for electricity. But not just any electricity. If you, now I show you the whole ad, you will see, well, you, it got cut off here, but it says private sector owned electric light and power companies. This is an advertisement for electricity generated by the private sector as opposed to the federal government, municipalities, or rural collect cooperatives and collectives. In fact, sorry, it was part of a major advertising campaign ran in the 1960s that was actually revising a campaign or revisiting, reprising, I guess is the word I want, revisiting a campaign that had already been run once before in the 1920s. Both in the 1920s and again in the 1960s, the American electricity industry ran a major propaganda and advertising campaign to promote private sector electricity, both as cheaper, financially cheaper, but more fundamentally, as protective of American freedom. Freedom is not lost by guns alone. And again, they kept, the, most of the, a lot of the pictures are pictures of East Germany, uh, which, you know, early 60s, this is very resonant, right? But the main theme is not, it's not that your electricity is better, because if you turn on the light, like I always say today about solar energy, I mean, my electricity in my house is all solar. I turn on my lights, it's no different than your electricity if it comes from coal or oil or gas. There's no difference in the electricity you get from public or private power. But the argument is there's something else, though, at stake here, and that something is your freedom. So here's another one from the same advertising campaign. Will you leave these freedoms to your children? And so here's this nice American boy, and he's got these four things in front of them, the Bible, a key, a pencil, and a ballot. And what do they represent? The Bible is freedom of religion. The key is the right to privacy. The pencil is the right to free expression. The ballot is the right to democratic governments. And the ad tells us half the world is trying to destroy these four symbols and what they stand for. So now it's not just about electricity. This is about a cosmic battle, a Manichaean battle of good and evil. And half of the world is out there trying to destroy your freedom. And the other half is what? Represented by? Private sector electricity? Yeah, <laughs> that's in fact the answer. This is the resurgence of a major propaganda campaign, which as I already mentioned, ran in the 1920s to discredit publicly owned and operated electrical generating plants. The argument both in the 20s and the 60s had this two main components. The first was ideological, that government run electricity was a threat to freedom and democracy. So a farmer's rural co cooperative, for example. So here we are again, the slippery slope to socialism. A bunch of farmers get together, create a cooperative. The next thing you know, we're living behind the Berlin Wall. Um, and however, and this is where I come in, also an ostensibly factual claim, the claim that government-run electricity was more expensive than private sector electricity. So here you see an argument that we've seen made many, many times throughout the 20th century, that the private sector is more efficient than the government, that the government is inefficient, bloated, bureaucratic, blah, blah, blah. So therefore, anything the government does is going to be less efficient and more expensive than anything the private sector does. The problem with the argument 
is that it was false. Oh, here's another example. How to save taxpayers half a billion dollars? Don't build federal hydropower plants. Actually, I don't really like this one because I don't really like federal hydroelectric plants either, <laughs> but for different reasons. So we'll skip that one. Okay, and then here's another one. Do you know how much your family's taxed to pay for public power? So the claim that it's, you may think it's cheap, but it's actually super expensive. Um, oh, and this one, this is one of my favorites. So they're arguing that there's two kinds of electricity. Uh, public electricity, electricity from the federal government versus electricity from the electric company. And of course, you may think they're the same because the light bulbs in these two pictures look the same. But in fact, they claim electricity from private sector is cheaper, pays taxes as opposed to using them, is available to everyone without discrimination, and plays a key role in America's free enterprise system. And here's what I really love. The pretty woman represents electricity from the private sector, and this dumbfounded guy <laughs> you know, represents the federal government. So, okay. And you'll notice also, if you go back here, public power, well, you probably can't see it, but public power is put in scare quotes. So there's a kind of jujitsu move going on here where the private sector is equated with the public, like British public schools, and public power, which is the government, is asserted not to actually be in the hands of the public at all, but to be in the hands of an interfering, incompetent, and potentially frightening government. And again, the claim here, which you know, we've seen but subsequently, the key claim is this, that by interfering in the marketplace, the government's threatening private property and personal freedom. And that's the merchants of doubt argument. There it is again, but it's 40 years earlier. It's not invented by the tobacco industry. It's actually, well, we don't know who invented it. We have to keep going back further, but we see the same argument being used in the 1920s by the electricity industry. So these arguments in the 60s had all been made in the 1920s, and they were developed by an organization called NILA, the National Electric Light Association, a trade group representing private generated electricity. In the oh, so NILA had been established in the 1880s, but expanded and strengthened in the 1920s under the influence of Thomas Insull, the great Chicago industrialist. And it represented the holding companies that in the late 19th and 20th century owned most of the local private utilities in the United States. In the 1930s, the Federal Trade uh, Commission investigated NILA, uh, actually a series of investigation, and found that they had organized a massive propaga pa propaganda campaign designed to discredit municipal electricity and impugn the motives and loyalty of the people who supported and advocated it. How did they do this? Well, they targeted newspapers and other print media. They supplied press releases. They wrote articles, editorials, op-eds, many of which were written by uh, what later came to be known as third-party allies, so people who didn't work for the electricity industry. They appeared to be independent, but they really weren't, um, and the tobacco industry, as we know, did this a lot. Attempts to influence radio, film, and theater, so it was a whole campaign to influence Hollywood. Um, attacks on politicians who supported, uh, well, something called Giant Power, which I don't have time to talk about today, but which was a big uh, s a proposal for state-funded electricity in Pennsylvania or other public uh, projects. But the largest focus, and I think this is a really, really interesting part of the story, was the educational system. In the 1920s, Nilo organized a campaign to rewrite textbooks in America, textbooks in economics and civics and governance. What they did was they hired a group of people to survey all the existing college and high school texts, especially in the areas of civics and economics and to identify textbooks which they considered to be hostile to private enterprise. And then to begin to pressure publishers, colleges and universities, school districts and libraries to drop the textbooks that they considered objectionable. Well, what made a textbook objectionable? Well, the claim, so Neela claimed that these textbooks were not objective, or in some cases they said that they were overtly socialistic. In practice, though, Neela objected to almost anything that cast the electric power industry in an unflattering light, or anything that suggested that there could be a place for publicly generated in, uh, electricity. So for example, in the 1920s, a lot of people were making the argument that the private sector had done a good job in supplying electricity to urban environments like New York and Chicago, but not to rural areas, and yet rural areas in some ways needed it even more, like farmers, for example. There was a big argument that was made that 
farmers need electricity more than anybody else because of all the labor on the farm, and yet almost no American farmers had electricity like in 1919. Um, but if a book suggested that, Nila would object to it. So here's an example of some objectionable text in a civics textbook. Quote, private contributions by rich men and corporations who are interested in securing certain laws and policies have been known to give generously to both party funds so as to stand in well and get what they want, whatever party is successful. Large campaign funds coming from hidden sources have led to serious corruption in the elections. Plus a change, eh? <laughs> so this was an example of objectionable text. Other things, terms, Neela made a list, a, a sort of blacklist of words, like vocabulary blacklist, words that they found objectionable. They included phrases like overcapitalization, stock watering, abuses in rate making, weaknesses in regulatory practices, reasonable rates, fair return, or even the words public utility. All of these were considered objectionable by Neela. So what did they do? They offered money to authors of leading texts to write new editions, suggesting, and if they agreed to do it, like maybe you wrote a textbook and you would be happy to update it, and now someone's saying, oh, well, I'd like to pay you to update your textbook. And then if the author agreed, then they would send them a list of suggested changes that they would like to see. When authors didn't agree to change their things, then they hired other authors to write alternative textbooks, promoting the ideology of free market capitalism. And then once the books were published, they sent free copies to schools, colleges, libraries all around the country and pressured school districts to adopt these new texts. And this is a tactic that we know the tobacco industry did. It's a tactic that we've seen the fossil fuel industry use in recent years as well. And this is my favorite part. They funded academic studies to prove that public power was more expensive than privately generated, even though actually the truth was the opposite. And we know the truth was the opposite because um, part of the reason this came up as an issue was when Gifford Pinchot was, pres was uh, governor of Pennsylvania, he did an analysis where he looked at electricity in Ontario, right, you know, not far away from us, not far away from Pennsylvania, and Ontario had a system of publicly generated electricity in which electricity was supplied to all Ontarians, rural or urban, at the same price, and power was being delivered more cheaply in Ontario than was in New York State right across the border. And so Pinchot became interested in thinking about alternative ways to make sure that you could bring power to everyone. And he proposed a program in Pennsylvania called Giant Power to do that. He became the target of these NILA people who tried to, they campaigned heavily against him when he came up for re-election. And he did win, but only barely, and probably because his opponent was completely corrupt. And it was, that was like well known. <laughs> so um, in any event, so what did they do? They heavily promoted. They paid people to do studies to show that public power was more expensive. And then once the studies were done, they heavily promoted them to the press through press releases, bulletins, funded lecturers who would tour around the country. Um, and they worked to develop courses at colleges and universities. Um, and in some cases, whole curricula in economics and business administration extolling the virtues of laissez-faire capitalism. The purpose, in their own words, was to ensure, quote, straight economic thinking but by which they meant capitalistic free market principles, and to ensure the possession by young people and their teachers of correct information. And one of the targets was the Harvard Business School. So I'm very excited about getting to the archives at Harvard uh, to write a story about the origins of the Harvard Business School. <laughs> um, Harvard Business School already existed, but it was pretty small, and it expanded and grew a lot during this time. So one of the questions is, who was funding that expansion? And we have at least a little evidence that Neela is part of that story. OK, so here's Harvard, yep. So what would constitute con success in their view? Well, quote, this is a direct quote out of the FTC hearings. When judges, lawmakers, members of public utility commissions, prosecuting attorneys, and engineers, in short, all public officials, will be so trained as to automatically oppose genuine regulation, public ownership, honest valuations, and equitable rates. So, and in all of this, Neela often worked through, as I've already mentioned, so-called third-party allies to hide or minimize the Neela connection. In other words, to make it seem as if these studies were independent when they really weren't. And again, this is something we've seen and well-documented that was a classic tobacco industry strategy, but particularly the academic studies, to hide the funding to make it seem that these studies were objective, independent, credible academic investigations. 
When the FTC reviewed this, they concluded that it was not just propaganda, but the largest peacetime propaganda campaign in the history of the United States. And academics had played a key role, especially academic administrators, many of whom have actually welcomed NILA help, enthusiastically accepting NILA funds to develop courses and departments. And again, I mean, I think all of us have been in situations where we've seen our deans, our presidents get very excited about corporate funding to build programs and talk about how great that is. And sometimes it is great, but you know, this is a really serious issue for all of us in academic life because the experts then are used to lend credibility to these claims. So it's pretty obvious, I've already mentioned, we can see si very striking similarities to recent developments in a number of areas. One of the things we know creationists have done extensively is to focus on the rewriting of textbooks and pressuring textbook publishers to remove objectionable language from biology textbooks. And this has been well documented by people like Kenneth Miller and others. The tobacco industry, in my own work and the work of colleagues like Robert Proctor and Alan Brandt, we've shown how the tobacco industry funded so-called expert studies to prove that tobacco was not harmful and to create competing bodies of facts, competing narratives to suggest we didn't really know or that the scientific narrative was in, in, uh, correct. And of course, in climate change denial, one of the key arguments, emergence of doubt, is this accusation that climate scientists are really socialists who threaten uh, to undermine American freedom and liberty. And in all these domains, one of the common threads is the use of experts to lend credibility to industry claims and to hide the industry role. To make the discussion seem like an objective fact-based debate and not what it really was, which was a propaganda campaign, while at the same time impugning the integrity and motivations of opponents. So the industry is motivated by the profit motive. And again, we see this all the time. I, mean, I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten saying that climate change, climate scientists are just in it for the money. And I'm like, yeah, and ExxonMobil isn't? I mean, it's so weird in a way, right, that this idea of impugning the motives of scientists has been so effective, uh, even though obviously, but somehow ExxonMobil just, what, wants to help us all escape energy poverty, right? Okay, so obviously I think there's a lot of different lessons that can be taken from this this is a very complicated and interesting story that can be taken in a lot of different ways, but there's two things that I think I'd like to underscore here tonight. One is the obvious point that, you know, post-truth was supposed to be the word of 2016, but this is not a new thing, right? The practices associated with this, the creation of alternative facts, the claim, the use of studies to claim facts to uh, counterbalance actual uh, independent studies, um, false equivalents, you know, the abuse of expertise, these are, this is an old story uh, in the United States. But what I think has not been adequately recognized is the way in which it's been linked in so many cases, in climate change denial, in the tobacco industry, and now in this uh, history of electricity, to the promotion of laissez-faire capitalism, or neoliberalism as we might call it now, to insist that anybody who's raising a question is somehow un-American and somehow threatening our freedom. So I want to argue that this terrain is wide open for a deeper, more thoroughgoing investigation, not just of climate change, but of a whole host of issues in relation to big questions of power, right? The power of large industries in the United States and also the energy that runs our country. So it comes up in a very obvious way with respect to climate change, but it's, I think, also really important in a number of other areas as well. One of the things that's been interesting to me in doing this work on NILA is that NILA was the subject of a major, f a major series of federal investigations in the late 1920s and 1930s. The FTC investigations are like 32 volumes long, and yet there is no recent secondary literature on this at all, at all, at all. And I only even learned about this by a book that I've taught a lot of times, Tom Hughes' Networks of Power, published in 1983 originally. I was teaching it two years ago and rereading this. There was a little footnote about the NILA propaganda campaign. And I thought, oh, that's interesting, which is why I always tell my students to read the footnotes. Because often when scholars see interesting things that they don't have time to work on, they stick it in the footnotes. So there's like a host of great things buried in footnotes. So, so why haven't we done this work already? Why has this been sort of invisible to us? Well. I think there are a lot of reasons. I mean, life is complicated. There are many reasons why we don't do the things we don't do. But I think one of the things that has certainly affected historians is the fear of being seen as overly political. 
or biased. I'm, I'm here in New York, I'm at NYU, this is Gallatin, I can talk about capitalism and neoliberalism, and you guys are all fine with it. If I were in North Dakota, this talk would have a slightly different tone, um, although I would still tell the same story, but in a maybe with a little bit of different vocabulary. Um, but you know, the fear of being seen as overtly political is something that a lot of academics worry about. So my answer to that is something that Ashley Montague told us a long time ago. <laughs> Reality has a well-known liberal bias. And I think we'll leave it at that. Oh, I think, no, maybe I have one more slide. Oh, and the time to act is now. Thank you very much. I can repeat the question. The question is about the issue of fair return. So, right, this is an interesting both technical and historical question. So the issue in the Neela story, though, in the 1920s had to do with the idea of these as being natural monopolies. So as electricity began to develop in the United States, people recognized that it would be wasteful and inefficient to have competing electric lines. And so it was argued that electricity, like railroads, was a natural monopoly. But if the government was going to accept that and allow these companies to have a monopoly, then there had to be regulations. Otherwise, the companies could charge anything and people would you know, have no recourse. So the idea of a reasonable rate of return was written into a lot of the early regulation. And typically at that time, in m much of this literature, and there's, I mean, I haven't gone into this in great depth, and maybe you know more about it than I do, but typically they talk about a reasonable rate of return being between 5 and 7 percent at that time for this industry. But there was evidence that many of these companies were making 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 percent, but they were hiding the profits through different kinds of uh, accounting shenanigans to try to make it seem as if they were not actually getting the return that they were when in reality they were getting returns well in excess of what had been accepted as the reasonable rate of return. So that's what the argument is, and that's partly why the FTC got involved, because it's a complaint about trade and a complaint that they're actually violating the conditions under which they've been granted these uh, licenses. Yeah. Well, I think it's both. I mean, I think, it, you know, the point about educating individuals, it all depends who the individuals are, you know. I mean, we're all educators, so if we give up on the idea that educating individuals is meaningful, then we're kind of, it's kind of sunk, right? So um, I don't want to ever say that it's hopeless to educate individuals. And in my experience, many people are interested in learning more, and especially if you can step back from the immediate moment and show people how there's this larger, different story that they never knew about. I mean, when we first started working on Merchants of Doubt, and I started showing people, not just telling people, but showing people the way in which climate change now ha was linked to the history of tobacco, I mean, there were times I gave talks where you could hear audible gasps in the room, and that was so great. I was like, okay, I've really found something that, you know, is surprising to people. So if you can surprise people, um, you know, then you can often open up uh, a way to reach them. That said, you know, there are some people who are hopeless. <laughs> you know, there are people in this country who still think that tobacco doesn't cause smoking. Uh, there are people who think that, you know, we attacked ourselves on September 11th. You know, there's all, you know, there's all kinds of weird things out there, and there's, you know, some things, you can't win every battle, and sometimes you have to decide. It's like when I'm on an airplane and people ask me, what do you do for a living? And I have to look at the person and say, Hmm, do I want to tell this person what I do for a living, you know, right? Or do I just want to have a quiet plane ride? So, um, you know, you have to make choices. But I'll, I'll tell you one funny story about that. So I, I used to always say, you know, there are some people who are just hopeless. And if you go home at Thanksgiving and Uncle Joe is a climate change denier, you might just decide that we're not talking about climate change at Thanksgiving this year. And just recently I gave a talk at Harvard um, where someone in the audience, it was getting kind of late, at night, and I was pretty tired. It was a week nine, and I wanted to go home. So it's like 10 o'clock at night, and he says, well, you know, my family lives in Texas, and they're Pentecostals, and they think the end of the world is coming. What should I do? And I said, it's hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, everyone laughed, but the funny thing about that was like three days later, my good buddy, Catherine Hayhoe, who's an evangelical Christian and a climate scientist, I can't say she's a Christian scientist, because that sounds like something else, <laughs> but, um, we ended up having a big discussion about Thessalonians, and evidently there is a section in Thessalonians where the people, anybody know this? The people are sitting around kind of doing nothing, and, and they say, well, the world's going to end, so why should we do anything? We may as well just wait. And Paul says to them, you don't know when the world is going to end. Only God knows that. So meanwhile, get up, 
and get to work and take care of your families. I'm like, oh, well, that's what you say to the Pentecostals in Texas. So the answer is, no matter who the person is, there actually may be a way to reach them, but it might take homework, it might take work to figure out what is the, what is the way you're going to reach a Pentecostal in Texas, right? I have a question. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, in terms of the three examples you gave, electricity, private companies, tobacco companies, and other fossil fuel companies, mm -hmm. they were able for a time to convince people that their very particular interests represented the common good. So where do you think is the main leverage in terms of the tipping point showing that not to assume that Neil Klein is correct in saying it's an entire capitalist system, Good. but if we're looking now, we have a short period of time, maybe 20 years, to avoid climate change tipping points. We obviously can't overthrow the entire capitalist system. Right. But the, if the main culprit, as we have seen, is the fossil fuel industry, how do we convince people? Do they have to wait to see it for themselves, for example, now in right. Texas and Florida with two climate change deniers, that maybe they should rethink right. policies? Well, I think what you said is exactly right. I mean, my view is that we need a bit of a divide and conquer strategy. It's not, I don't actually think it is all of capitalism. I think we have certain industries that are pr actually corrupt and that have products that are deeply, deeply damaging. And if you think about the history of tobacco, I mean, one of the things that's interesting about that history is that there was evidence for a long, long time, going back to the 1930s, that tobacco was harmful, but, you know, you could still say that up until the 1950s, it, you know, we can argue about how clear the scientific evidence was or not. I mean, my buddy Robert Proctor would say it was absolutely clear, and Hitler knew that tobacco, you know, caused cancer. Uh, but in any event, but let's just give p the industry the benefit of the doubt. But there comes a point in the 1950s where the scientific evidence becomes clear, and the industry knows it, and they say that in their own memos. And then there's a moment where they have to make a decision, and it really is a moment. I mean, this was one of the amazing discoveries we had. And, uh, you know, when we were writing the book, I, you know, had this visual image of these guys sitting around a table at the Plaza Hotel, because we know that's where they met, where they made the decision that day in that room to fight the facts and to hire the Hill and Knowlton Company to help them build a campaign to d discredit and deny the science. And that, to me, is the moment in which the industry becomes unforgivable, right? Because up until then, you can say, okay, well, look, people like smoking, people enjoyed it. If you didn't know for sure it was killing people, you know, then maybe that's okay. But when you know that the product is deadly and now you deny that in public and continue to sell it. So I feel that the fossil fuel, and, and we have, in a sense, effectively demonized the tobacco industry, and I think rightly so. I mean, sometimes people say to me, why are you demonizing industry? I'm like, I'm not demonizing industry. I'm demonizing the tobacco industry because I've read these documents, and these are people who consciously, knowingly sold a product that was killing people, killing children, killing babies, and they lied about it right? And they broke the law. So, you know, I'm not criminalizing them. They criminalize themselves. So I think we need to do a kind of divide and conquer thing and to say, when industries do things like that, that's really problematic. That doesn't mean there aren't lots of great companies building solar panels or, you know, apps for your phone or shoes. You know, I mean, lots of companies do lots of good things and make goods and services that we like and we benefit from. So I think that kind of making it clear we're talking about a certain set of practices um, often in industries that are monopolistic, which is the other thing too, I mean the people who think they're defending free market capitalism, I mean all of these industries have been involved in monopolistic practices. Remember, the fossil fuel industry was the original, you know, standard oil that got busted up under Sherman antitrust legislation. Well, not the original, there were some others, but I mean one of, you know, the biggest, the single biggest antitrust litigation in the history of the United States was standard oil, right? So um, these people don't really believe in free market capitalism, they don't really believe in competition, um, what they believe in is, you know, as we used to say when I was a geology PhD student, squeezing the earth for all it's worth, right? <laughs> you know, so. And I think, I just want to say one other thing about the, about the time frame. I guess that's one reason wh why I do diverge a bit from Naomi Klein, and this might be wishful thinking on my part, but when I re read her book, I actually felt incredibly worried because I feel like if we have to change everything, then I do think it's hopeless because I don't think we can change everything in 20 years. And I actually, I think 20 years is optimistic. I mean, I think we're on a very tight fuse <laughs> now. I mean, that's my personal read of the scientific data. But let's say 20 years is you know, a fair guesstimate. I mean, we're not going to change everything in 20 years. And if you tell people that we have to change the entire economic system in 20 years, I think a lot of people will just say, well, that's impossible, and give up. Whereas if you say, 
we have a couple of rogue industries that have a history of lying to the American people, justifying corrupt practices in the name of personal liberty and laissez faire capitalism, and it's been a lie all along, and it's still a lie. That seems to me to be, so we have to get this industry under control. That seems to me something that we could do in 20 years, um, and that seems like a manageable problem. Yeah. I'm a freshman here, and honestly, I'm pretty worried about the world uh, that my kids are going to grow up in. And I'm ca I came to Gallatin to have the freedom to learn how to stop climate change. Um, do you have any advice for how I can have the most impact with my life to stop <laughs> it? <laughs> you know, I get asked that question all the time, and I want to say if I could figure it out, I would write a really great how-to book, get a really good agent, and retire. Um, so how do you know? What, how did you put it? How to like? What should I do with my What should I do with my life? Yeah. Um, what's that? Yeah. There you go. Um, look, you know, this is a really difficult issue, but I, I think, you know, you have to work from your strength and your passion, and that's one of the great things about Gallatin, right? Is that and I'm going to say we here because I still feel connected to the school. You know, we try to empower students to work from their strengths and their passion, and to decide to figure out for yourself what is that mix of education skill development, knowledge, factual basis, talents that will enable you to do your special thing in the world, right? And I can't tell you what that is. All I can do is say the good thing about how bad climate change is is because it's so big, it has elements of everything, right? There are scientific elements. There are legal, very important legal elements. I mean, I do think the legal aspects are very, very important right now. So if you're at all interested in the law, I think that would be a very good thing to pursue right now. But there's political aspects, there are economic aspects, um, you know, there's communication aspects, there's psychological, psychological aspects, aspects, right? Thank you, right, you know. Um, so, it, so almost no matter what you're interested in, sports, I mean, I have a friend whose son is now working on sustainable golf. And that like sounds like an oxymoron, right? But let's face it, a lot of Americans like to play golf, and the kinds of people who like to play golf are sometimes the kinds of people who are not always on board about climate change as an issue. If you could reach that community, right? How great would that be? Which reminds me of one of my favorite things when we were writing the chapter on acid rain, William Ruckelhaus, who was the um, head of EPA under Nixon and um, in the days when Republicans were not all climate change and environmental deniers. And one of the things he said in an interview with William F. Buckley on television, he said, Republicans have to understand that acid rain falls on golf courses. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, hi. hi. Sorry, um, these lights are very, very bright. Yeah, no worries. Um, in talking about the science narrative, you mentioned how scientists in the Paris Accords failed to understand the politics of knowledge. So um, I would appreciate if you could elaborate more on that point, because I think especially now with younger generations and younger people in general, one of the things we really appreciate about the presentation of the predicament of climate change is whether or not it's colloquial. So for instance, you might not understand the implications of how climate change affects the environmental systems. So if you're talking to a person that has little to no knowledge of climate change or environmental systems in the as a whole, they'll tell you, oh, that's not my problem, I don't understand any of it, it's not my place to you know, have a concern about, about it. So if you can explain how scientists will insert that colloquial nature into further presentations of climate change, that's why I would like to understand. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure that there's a simple answer to it. And if you're interested in this, I would definitely recommend Josh Howe's book, Behind the Curve. It's a really, really nice piece of work. Um, I think part of what um, the critique is this idea that scientists thought that their job could be narrowly defined. And that was a strictly scientific, so a kind of you could say a kind of anti-Gallatin framework, right? We're scientists, you know, just the facts, ma'am, kind of thing. We're scientists, we're in this domain. We do the calculations, we run the climate models. You want to know, you know, where does the danger kick in? Looks to us like it's about two degrees. That should be around, you know, 350 ppm, although that's, there's, there's a little bit of weirdness there, but let's just say 350 parts per million is a close enough approximation. We give you that information and we leave it to you to use it. But we don't think that we have the obligation, the responsibility, or even that it would be a good idea for us to speak to community groups, talk to the political scientists across campus, you know, 
talk to the people who are writing the regulations because that's someone else's job. And if we do that, we will be viewed as compromising our objectivity, right? Because it's also tied up with an epistemological model that says that objectivity is tied up with political neutrality. So there's a whole really complicated like, set of issues embedded in that. What a lot of scientists didn't realize, and, and I've talked to some of the people who are involved in this, and you know, they're good people, right? They're people who thought they were doing the right thing, right? Um, what they didn't understand was that it was going to provoke this giant campaign against them. And you know, one of my favorite stories from the work we did was when I met Ben Santa, who was the scientist who first did the work that showed that the observed warming could not be explained by natural variability. It's a really, really important piece of scientific work. And he did it pretty young. He was like in his, 30s, he had only recently finished his postdoc, and he did it at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, so he's like, you know, not exactly in a radical place, right? Um, and he becomes the target of a giant attack in the pages of the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, he told me the story years later, and even years later, like, he was shaking telling this story, and he said to me, he goes, I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea. And then years later, he read an article. I mean, this is, the, this is how we introduced the book with this story. He reads an article in the, in the paper about how some of these people, you know, or, or it was about the history of tobacco. It was about, like, the litigation around tobacco. And he's reading this, and he goes, wow, this sounds so much like what happened to me. And so when I met him, I said, well, Ben, the reason is because it was the same people, you know? <laughs> and he had no idea. He had no idea what he was up against. And, of course, it's not his fault, you know, he's trained as a scientist, he, you know, spends years honing his capabilities, mathematical, you know, thermodynamics, et cetera, et cetera, but he doesn't know anything about any of these other issues, and so when it happens, it totally blindsides him, and it totally blindsides the whole community he's part of. So then when he reaches out to colleagues and says, this thing is happening, and the colleagues want to help him, what do they do? They publish an open letter in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. Right, exactly, like you laugh. But they thought they were doing the right thing. Why? Because they're thinking in their own minds, Ben Santer's integrity and reputation as a scientist is being attacked. We have to defend and protect that. How do we do that? We do that inside the scientific community. So they did that and they protected him successfully. So his career is protected, but in the larger world, the claim goes un unanswered. And that was the case for a really long time. It was only a few years ago that the IPCC even hired a communications officer. I mean, how like crazy is that, right? Yeah. We ended with the time to act is now. And you're saying how scientists weren't doing what they could have done. Once the papers are written, any of us can act on this thing. But I didn't hear, when I see these, when you're doing this exactly, if I talk to people about reducing their emissions. Mm -hmm. If I talk to them about not bringing this toxic or bringing this toxic back with them to shore, they can do that. Mm -hmm. If I talk to them about flying back, mm -hmm. I get condemned for emotional mm. intense pushback. Mm. This university has a big push on a global campus. Mm -hmm. I've n I don't know if anyone's done this calculation, but how much flying that we're Giant. promoting <laughs> ourselves and we are paying for yeah. while trying to build fossil fuels. Yeah. We have just as much ability to do what you're saying scientists should be doing, but they're not trained in these things. They're not right. trained No, no, it's totally fair. That's what I wanted you to think. I mean, that is the, this is the call to action. This is exactly the point. I would like everyone in this room to start thinking about wor where are the points of contact, the levers. And the issue you raise is a huge one, and I've thought about it too, because my own carbon footprint is mostly travel. Um, it's true of almost every leading research university in this country that we all have faculty who travel all the time. And as you say, the push has been to travel more and go to more meetings and have global campuses, and it is highly problematic, and I think it would be really good if campuses like Harvard and NYU, you know, if faculty, if a group of faculty would create some kind of core to begin to raise this as a question on campus, why are we all traveling so much, and could we do more with video links, you know, could we think about not privileging international conferences so much, you know, when we're reviewing people's stature. I mean, what are some of the alternatives that could be involved in institutional commitments? And while we're at it, could NYU put some wind turbines on the roofs of some of these nice buildings? Which, by the way, if anybody's interested in, and most people don't know, there's like some really interesting mid-scale wind turbine technology that exists now. Um, there's some really cool ones on some buildings in Boston. So, you know, there are a lot of things we could be doing. and. So I, I want us to be thinking about those things. <laughs>
Yeah. That means there's answers, and we'd like to work on that. And we need to hear your help. What's your name? Joshua Sodak. And you're in what department? Or I forget. I'm or actually producing up here, SPS. SPS, what's that? Uh, school of Professional Studies. Okay, School of Professional Studies. Josh, did you say? Yes. Josh, okay. So talk to Josh and get together with him and create a campus committee on <laughs> travel reduction. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Well, I agree. Again, I mean, we have a dean here who has her hand up. Do you want to say something about that? Well, actually, I was going to make a little more point. Oh. Certainly, the climate change initiative here is intended to begin that kind of process. And I did want to say that Peter Unker and Mitch Joachim's class last semester designed a Gallatin 2061, although that's too many years now, Peter. You're going to have to change it, which was a completely, entirely energy-sustaining building. Um, based on the space of this building. Um, I had a different kind of question. Um, Could I just say one thing on yeah, that, so too, and then I'll take a question? Yeah. But I mean, if you're interested in this, a person who would be really great to invite is John Sturman at NI MIT. Does anybody know him? John built this computer program called Climate Interactive, which is a policy um, simulation where you can put in things like a carbon tax of $35 a ton and see what it does to emissions in a particular country. It's a really great teaching tool because you can get your students using it. And people at UMass Lowell are now using this in workshops, both with students and also like taking it on the road. Uh, it's a very, very effective thing. And one of the things you can do with that is to think about what you can also do institutionally at home. So mm -hmm. could you put in solar panels or could you put up wind turbines or could you, you know, reduce food waste um, in the cafeterias? I mean, there's a lot of things. And of course, food is another really giant issue that I don't talk a lot about because my own background is in physical sciences. But I mean, and this gets back to what you said about, you know, people, I mean, you do get pushback when you tell people they have to change the way they live, right? A lot of people don't like that. And so I don't like to say you have to do X, but I like to say you could do X. And one of the things you could do, for example, is eat less red meat. Because the scientific evidence regarding the carbon footprint, and not just carbon, but the entire environmental footprint of beef is gigantic. And it's way bigger than, for example, lamb. So if you like meat and you don't want to give up meat, like my husband, like I finally got my husband to agree that we're going to eat lamb and pork but not beef, you know, or, and you can have goat's milk instead of cattle milk. And it actually makes a very significant difference. And that's something that we can do. And it doesn't mean you like have to be a vegan, but it means that there are things you can do. And if you have a school cafeteria, you can ask the ca most college cafeterias don't even offer like goat milk, for example, or maybe they do here. I don't know. Most places they don't. <laughs> At Bowdoin they did, but <laughs> you know. But I mean, the point is, so there there are things that are within our capacity, and of course, most people don't know this. A lot of people think the minute you say food, they think oh, vegan, and then they're like they're shut down because they're not going to become a vegan, right? But actually, there's a lot you can do that's well short of being a vegan, but still makes a difference. So yeah. Well, so my question sort of follows up on this, although I really think this pedagogical issue is one that we should explore more tomorrow. It's really great points. My question um, was, uh, is sort of related to this issue of what people feel they're losing mm. if they do, do something to ch about climate change. So when you think about the tobacco industry, here you have something that basically isn't important. Its main thing is that people enjoy it, which is great. You know, alcohol is the same way, but y you know, the, you don't have to have it. Mm -hmm. If you get rid of it, it's okay, right? But I think a lot of people feel that their lives, and I'm thinking now of the whole politics around these coal miners who don't even really mine anymore. They only strip mine, but anyway, yeah. um, you know, that people feel that their jobs, that whole sort of aspects, I mean, it is, it is arguably true that oil, gas, coal, carbon-related industries are a genuinely massive part of the economy. They're not and that so big in terms of jobs, though, actually. No, yeah. and so I think yeah. that one of the things I was going to ask you to talk about is, um, you know, it seems so obvious to me that a space for helping to make this argument more persuasive and less threatening is related to the vast 
evidence of all of the things that can replace this economy, including the solar issue. Right. I was so struck a year ago when there was a, a bunch of articles in the paper about China has seen that solar energy is the future, and they're now doing everything we do is built in China because they've put all this e this um, investment into that. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about those sets of issues because I think that people fear that what's being talked about is something that's so massive that it, and I love everything you've said about the, you do this. It's not the whole economy. It's not the whole this. Right. But I do feel like that there is a real difference in some ways between tobacco and what people perceive as the sort of scale of oil, uh, uh, petroleum, coal, et cetera. Yeah. Well, that's a great question, and I, and I agree with you. So a few things on this. I mean, one thing that is important to recognize, though, in hindsight, it's easy to say, well, nobody had to smoke. It wasn't that big a deal. But actually, it's not how people talked about it at the time, and in particularly the industry, because so much of the economy of the South was tied up with tobacco, particularly states like North Carolina, that they made a claim that was not that dissimilar to what is sometimes said now, that like the whole economy of the United States will collapse if we get rid of tobacco. Now, but that's important because the reality is it didn't collapse, and not only did it not collapse, but the economy of North Carolina is richer, stronger, more diversified, better today than it was then. So the same, that it's important for people to know that, right? Because it means the same thing can happen for West Virginia or Kentucky or North Dakota. We have alternatives, and again, there, I mean, there's a lot of big lies around all these stories. One of the big lies is that there are all these jobs in fossil fuels. There are actually very few jobs in fossil fuels. Coal mining in the United States, 35,000 people. There are Far more, there are about 10 times as many people working in solar industry now in the United States than in coal. And the solar industry is everywhere. It's in all 50 states. So actually the opportunities for job creation through renewables are much, much greater than the opportunities in fossil fuels. But that message hasn't really got out. And I think you're right. And one of the problems with climate change is that a lot of the narrative around climate change, I didn't talk about this, but I could have, it's a narrative of suffering and loss. And I think that does make people shut down. And we talked about the psychological elements. So now this gets really tricky because I could get up here and tell you a good news story about renewable energy, and I have that talk, actually. <laughs> um, and, you know, and this is really tricky because then you could be criticized by some people for sort of glossing over it and making it all sound feel good and happy. Um, but then you give a really depressing talk about how bad it is. I could do that. I have that talk, too. Everybody's depressed, and everybody goes home and wants to shoot themselves, and then they give up. So it's like you kind of tr thread the needle here. You need to have a message that's bad enough that people get it, that this is a really, really serious problem, but yet also says, but there is a way forward, and it involves certain kinds of things, like isolating the fossil fuel industry and showing that they are a corrupt industry, but that doesn't mean that we necessarily have to change the entire capitalist system in 20 years, although we could still try to do that in the long run if we want to, but, right, or we can, you know, food is something that is under our control, right? We have a lot of power over food and our food choices. We don't have as much power over power, although it depends where you live, but if you live in a private home, I mean, um, I always have to choose different metaphors when I'm in different places, but um, if in many parts of America where people live in private homes, one of the single best things they could do is put solar panels on our roofs, and lots of Americans have the ca capability to do that. In Manhattan, it might be a little different. So it's different in different places, but I think that it's absolutely essential to sort of move forward by making clear that there are these alternatives. China is doing it, so if you want to appeal to patriotism and economic growth, we're actually missing a really significant opportunity. Germany, too. My solar panels came from Germany. Like, why is that? It doesn't make sense, right? We should be making solar panels in the United States. We should be building wind turbines in the United States. There's a lot of things we could be doing, and we're not doing them. Why? Because of the power of the fossil fuel industry. Yeah. The fossil fuel industry is, is trying to block it, and even as we speak, all across this country, utilities that are influenced by the fossil fuel industry because they have power purchase agreements are trying to block solar panel regulations, like in Utah, I mean, there's been big fights going on in Florida and Georgia and Utah. In fact, there's kind of a cool story about in Georgia, there's this group called the Green Tea Party. Do you guys know about them? Because they are like people who truly believe in competition, and the Coke industries had gotten involved in Georgia trying to block people from putting solar panels in their roofs and getting paid for it. And so these Green Tea Party people realized that the Koch brothers did not actually represent their interests. And so there's been some really interesting politics around that. And I think some of those stories are worth like pursuing and learning more about. 
Because if you can show ordinary people the Koch brothers do not have your interest at heart, you know, ExxonMobil does not have your interest in part. There are very few jobs in your community in fossil fuels, but you could easily have a lot of jobs in solar panel installation. Solar panel installation can't be outsourced, right? And that's the other big lie, too. I mean, I mean there were so many big lies in the last election that your head could spin, you know, so I just try to focus on a few key <laughs> ones for me. But the whole thing about immigration and jobs, right? I mean, the loss of jobs in places like Michigan has not largely been driven by outsourcing to Mexico and other places. It's largely been driven by technology. So that's a mixed story because that doesn't make it good when people lose their jobs to machines, but it's it makes it different than if people lose their jobs to a Mexican-American immigrant, right, or a Vietnamese-American immigrant. And so getting engaged in a conversation about, well, what do we do when people lose their jobs to machines? But that's not a new question, right? This country has looked at that issue before. Other countries have looked at that issue. There is a long, well-documented history of the relationship of industrialization to employment and unemployment. And we could use that history to say, we can solve the problems of you know, white working class people in Michigan who are underemployed or, or unemployed, but the solution is not to throw out 800,000 dreamers, right? Because that won't solve the problem because they're not the people who took your jobs, right? Um, I would like to come back to uh, pose a question which is more on a general topic you raised earlier, being European and even worse, German. Um, one takeaway... Yeah, I love the Germans. You made my solar panels. Uh, <laughs> not, not anymore. The Chinese are doing no, this I now. Know, know. Uh, but uh, one of the it's not so much about climate uh, protection uh, versus capitalism. It's more about introducing regulated markets. And like being German, I like regulated markets because we have very good, uh, a very good history of our social market economy. And I know that other neighbors like the French are tending to overregulate, but still we have good experiences in Europe. Though it's normally two steps forward, one step back, but it works in general. Yeah. So, but isn't it the DNA of this country like that? Regulated markets are bad. It's for weaklings. Um, <laughs> the faint-hearted. Yeah, and and all those um, examples you had, like tobacco industry, petroleum industry, they are actually just a symptom of that. But how are you going to change this? But this is DNA of the of the U.S. Like we can do everything, and we don't need regulation. The state is our enemy. So how can you change this? Because without this change, I suppose climate change is going to be different, uh, difficult. Well, thank you, because that's my next project. So if any of you get my proposal to review, please say this is good and it should be funded. <laughs> um, no, I, that's exactly right. But I want to say it's not in the DNA, right? I mean, the point is this has a history. We didn't always think, we didn't always deify markets. We didn't always believe in the magic of the marketplace. If you go back to you know, Sherman Antitrust and you go back to the history of electricity, and I mean, one of the things that's so interesting about the history of electricity was the recognition that, that the free market didn't bring electricity to rural Americans. And in fact, the federal government did step in and under rural electrification and Tennessee Valley Authority, we brought electricity to the rest of America. And again, that's a story that most people have forgotten or maybe they never knew. So, and the reality is that the notion of the free market is itself a myth, right? There's never really been a, quote, free market. Markets ha are always regulated to some degree or another. So the social question is exactly what you just said. It's, a, it's not about regulation or not regulation, free markets versus regulated market. It's about what degree of regulation is correct. And so as you said, we might say, OK, the French go a little too far. The United States doesn't go far enough. And we know we don't go far enough because now we have these giant problems where you know, the public, the true public, is left to foot the bill. I mean, look at, look at what's happened in Houston. I mean, we don't know yet what the damages are going to be, but $160 billion is not, probably not unrealistic. Who's going to be picking up that bill? You think ExxonMobil is going to come forward and volunteer to pay it? I don't think so. Right, so we, Americans, we're all going to be footing that bill, right? So it's about having a conversation about the relative costs of certain kinds of things, the cost of regulation and the cost of not regulation, right? And I think that's the conversation we need to have. And, and that's why I thought the Pope's encyclical was so important, because there has been a kind of deification of the marketplace in the United States, but it's mostly in the last 40 years. So a lot of Americans don't remember the conversations that took place in the 1890s or the 1920s or after the Great Depression, right? There was a huge amount of regulation of financial markets after the Great Depression. And the really interesting thing about that is that a lot of the regulations that were put in place in the 1930s 
were undone in the 1990s, right? I'm thinking about Glass-Steagall. So, I mean, there's a history there. There's a history of a kind of failure, a market failure that's remedied with a set of regulations. The regulations work, and I think a part of what happens in the United States, and this is one of the important cultural differences between the U.S. and Europe, it's what Adlai Stevenson said many years ago. The trouble with Americans is we haven't read the minutes of the previous meeting. <laughs> we don't remember. We forget. We think the past is irrelevant. We have this, I mean, this is, I think, deeply cultural. We have this extremely forward-looking kind of cultural mentality in the United States. Look forward, not back. Europe is very different, right? Europe is a lot, I mean, if you want to criticize the French, let's say, you know, it's a lot of looking back and not as much looking forward. I mean, you could say that about European culture in general. Whether it's good or bad, you know, again, it's about the balance, right? So these regulations are put in place. They work. And because they work, the problem seems to go away. And then someone comes along in the 1990s and says, why do we have these regulations? You know, they're getting in the way. And we have some ideas, things we'd like to do in our bank. And we can't do them because of these stupid, antiquated regulations. And then they lobby Congress. They spend a lot of money. They get Glass-Steagall repealed. And then, boom. You know, we lose that wall between the investment banks and the regular banks, and suddenly there's all kinds of weird stuff going on. So, and now we're in a situation where we probably need to have some serious re-regulation of financial markets. It's very hard to get that, right, for a variety of reasons, some of which are ideological, some of which have to do with just raw political power. So I think we're in a similar situation with respect to environmental regulation. United States put in place all kinds of really effective environmental regulations from you know, the night, sort of the early 60s, Wilderness Act is 1964, through, you know, through to Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act in the early 1970s, NEPA. There's this sort of 10-year period where the whole framework of modern environmental protection in the United States really gets put in place, and it works well. But because it works well, a lot of environmentalists think, oh, things are good, you know, we can go move on to something else. We don't have to worry about acid rain anymore, whatever it is. Um, or we don't tell the story of it because we think everybody knows, but they don't actually know. And then the fossil fuel industry, though, and other regulated industries start pushing back, start lobbying, start trying to, you know, roll these things back and funding candidates, right, who will promise to run on, you know, deregulatory agendas. And so there's been this tremendous pushback in the United States in the last 30 years or so against regulation, making regulation into the enemy, making the government the bad guy. Right? And I think we need to tell that story. So that's part of what I'm hoping to do. But I'm a social person. I like company. Just because I'm working on it doesn't mean other people shouldn't too. So yeah. I think there's a really big topic, and there's lots of room for lots of people to work on. I'd love to see you know, more political historians, more economic historians. How do we get to this place that you could say that, that it's in the DNA of America to hate regulation? I mean, I think you're right. I think a lot of people think that. It's actually not true, though. So why do we think it's true? Right? Yeah, are we just about out of time? I'm about running out of yeah. voice. <laughs> yeah, maybe one last question? Or do we, we, we wrap, call it a day? <laughs> okay. <coughs> I think I, I'm thinking, oh, okay, one, all right. I'll try to give you a quick answer. I really enjoyed your talk. And <coughs> Thank you. I don't, I'm keeping you working an extra five minutes. So it's sorry. Right. Uh, and, and I know you only had so much time, but uh, the first narrative about science um, I think this, this is kind of couched in that. I, I'd like to bring up David Keith at Harvard and the notion of geoengineering uh, being the kind of maximal solution to this very wicked and complicated problem that you've set the terms for. That we just can continue doing the politics and the psychology and the kind of the resource extraction at the rate that we're doing uh, uh, and that some scientist or engineering group will produce an answer that changes the uh, acidity level of the oceans or produce a, a seeds clouds so that we have a reflective covering that cools the earth, et cetera, et cetera. And a, lo a lot of these inventions or concepts uh, and, and the experimentation behind them seem really laudable. Uh, David Keith being probably one of the most convincing folks. But I'd be really curious to hear uh, your thoughts on geoengineering. Sure. Um, that's a really complicated question, so I'm going to keep it short because um, I am getting out of uh, voice here. I'm not in favor of geoengineering, and the main reason, there, there are two main reasons, and I actually know David well, and I think David is a well-meaning person, I think he's authentic, I think he really does want to stop this problem, and I think he does see it as all these other things are too complicated and will take too long, but this is something we could do now. But I disagree for two reasons. The first is scientific. Um, so the geoengineering that David is working on with the group at Harvard is a solar 
uh, radiation management program. It's to put particles in the sky to block sunlight and cool the earth that way. It does nothing to address the issue of ocean acidification, which is the sort of um, dark twin of climate change, right? It's the thing that doesn't get talked about as much, but when you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, some of that carbon dioxide gets dissolved in the ocean, forms carbonic acid, makes the ocean more acidic. And that's profoundly troubling because it potentially affects the base of the food chain. So anything we do that doesn't address ocean acidification, to me, is not a solution. So if we control greenhouse gas emissions, stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere, then we also stop the increase in ocean acidification. But if we deal with climate change by blocking sunlight, but the CO2 remains the same or continues to increase, we haven't solved the ocean acidification problem. And I think it could give people a false sense of security that we're addressing it when we're only actually addressing half of it. So that's one objection. The other is a political objection. And I've thought, I haven't done work on this, but I think this would be a really good, people are working on this, and I think this is another important area. It's the governance issue. I just don't see any way that this can be done democratically. I just don't see it. I mean, maybe there's a way, but if you ask the people involved in it, they don't have an answer. They say, oh, well, people, you know, people in the law school have to work on that. Um, but it seems to me it's profoundly undemocratic. It, it, it basically revolves around the idea that a small group of experts will make a set of decisions, possibly in some kind of consultative uh, procedure with governments, but it's not clear what that procedure looks like. Um, I just can't see any way that for this to be done democratically. I can't see any way for countries to agree on how to do it. Now, I mean, David would say, well, we have the same problem with the UN Framework Convention. You know, maybe, I don't know. It's a very complicated issue. But I just don't really see it as a solution. Um, at most, it buys you a bit of time, but you still have to convert the energy economy in the long run. So my view is, why not just get to work on you know, really solving the problem at its core, which is the greenhouse gas emissions, and the technology to do that exists, right? And that's the other key part. I mean, some of the people, there's a sort of weird thing going on now where some people who are pro-geoengineering or pro-nuclear power will say, well, we have to do this because we really have no choice. And I don't think that's true. I think we do have a choice. I think there's a lot of good evidence now that we can solve this problem uh, to a very large extent, at least 70 to 80 percent, if not 100, with existing renewable energy technology. Um, and you know, the other thing that's interesting, so many of the people you know, who are sort of you know, resistant about climate change do invoke the market, free market. But if you ask yourself, you know, where is the market putting its bets right now? Who are the big industrialists who are putting money into something? The answer is actually renewables. It's people like Elon Musk, right? There's a huge amount of money flowing into renewable energy. It's a huge amount of money flowing into storage uh, you know, work, and almost no private sector money going into nuclear power, right? So I mean, if you do think that there's some kind of wisdom in the marketplace, that wisdom is not pointing in the direction of nuclear power. Geoengineering, a little less clear because Bill Gates is backing uh, geoengineering, I don't know, you know what his thinking is about that, but there's no market-based model for how geoengineering works without a carbon tax, right? There's no incentive for anyone to do geoengineering. There's no profit in it because you can't sell it to anybody unless you're going to have a carbon tax for which you can get credits or something. So anyway, it's a very complicated issue, but I wouldn't, personally, I'm not, I'm not going to be investing in geoengineering. And, I'm, and you know, when I get more money, I'm still thinking about one of those domestic scale wind turbines at my house. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right.